Good morning and welcome to worship here at Providence Presbyterian Church. We are delighted that you have chosen to log in and join us in worship. Today we're celebrating communion. Virtually you can join us at home as well. We are excited that you are here and welcome all that have logged on from different parts of our country and our community. Many things are happening in the life of this congregation. We are still deployed doing the work of Jesus Christ. I want to invite you to our Zoom coffee hour immediately following this service. If you're interested in that, you can send us an email and you can be a part of our coffee hours, but it's a time for check-in. We also have What's Up Wednesdays at 12 noon. It's a time for check-in and also maybe a brief Bible study or meditation and a time of prayer. So we hope you think about those two things. These are challenging and difficult times in our own country. And we prayerfully ask that you continue to pray for peace and to pray for justice as we seek to make a difference in our world today by being the disciples that Jesus has called us to be. So sisters and brothers in Christ, let us worship God and give praise to God's holy name. Today, especially, we give thanks for all our graduates. Please join me in prayer as we pray for them. Gracious God, we ask that you pour your Holy Spirit upon these graduates here from Providence and all the graduates in our community and around the nation that have had to have their celebrations virtually. Help them to know that in spite of that, your future awaits them, that your hand will guide them and lead them forward in their lives. Help all of us to trust in your guidance and your leadership and especially today, O oh God, we ask your blessing upon these, your graduates. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. scripture lesson this morning is taken from Psalm 13. Hear God's word as it comes to us today from the psalmist. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I trusted in your steadfast love. 
My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because God has done bountifully with me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture lesson for today is from Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Listen for the word of God. I am black and beautiful, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark, because the sun has gazed on me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, you who my soul loves, where you, pa- where you pasture your flock, where you make it lie down at noon. For why should I be like one who is veiled beside the flocks of your companions? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know that moment when you first wake up? That moment when you are no longer asleep and not yet fully awake. The moment of first thoughts. Someone once told me that, told me to pay attention to those first thoughts because they are an indication of where you are emotionally and spiritually. I've been doing this through the pandemic. On some days, my first thought is, thank you for another day. But on most days, my first thought is, oh Lord, how long? Or some sentiment of that. How much longer? It is the monotony of sameness. It is the grief of death. It is the fear of not knowing what is coming next. It is the fear of the decisions that I will be making As we open up, the list could go on. And I know that you could add things to that list. A week or so ago, we woke woke up to a front page full of names. Names obtained from death notices from newspapers around the country and attempt to frame incalculable incalculable loss. A visible image of loss. We have our own names, don't we? Lee Schooler and Shirley Strang. Oh Lord, how long I can't breathe. I can't breathe might have been the dying words of 100,000 plus people just before they were intubated. I can't breathe were the dying words of George Floyd as a police officer kept a knee on his neck for nearly nine minutes while Floyd laid handcuffed on the ground. I can't breathe George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and the list goes on and on. Our passage for today is from the book of Song of Solomon, and it's different from every other book of the Bible, for it is a book of poetry. There is no mention of God or traditional religious themes. Instead, we are left to draw on our own experiences of love, longing, mutuality, sensuality, and connectedness. In Song of Songs, as it's also known, we are, and I quote, invited to find God in ourselves. We are invited to perceive the parallels between human passion and religious pathos. We are invited to weigh our noblest ideas against our senseless prejudices, and we are invited to let our deepest yearnings direct us to what is eternal. What better way of prompting us to probe the depths of our thinking about God 
to examine our unexamined prejudices and to dive deep below the surfaces of our narrow notions than to invite us to contemplate simultaneously love and bigotry. Given the circumstances of our nation, this is a good reason to dive into the nuances of this poetry. However, this is not the reason I chose this passage for this sermon. I was led to this reading by a friend who shared a story about a black man, a dear friend and colleague who talked about the moment he realized he was caught up in the clutches of white supremacy. He was preaching to his congregation and his then young daughter was sitting in the front pew. He was reading the passage and when he got to, the, to verse five, I am dark but lovely, he said that as the phrase left his mouth, he looked up and he saw his beautiful, dark, innocent daughter and he said, I almost began to weep in the middle of my sermon. He thought dark but lovely? What is this saying to her? What is this saying to me about who we are as black people made in the image of God? He later realized that the conjunction but was a decision of translation. The people translating the Hebrew could have used the word and, I am dark and lovely. As you know, there are many versions of the Bible. As they pertain to the Presbyterian Church and our historical use of these different versions, the progression of translation for this verse has been this. King James Version. I am dark and comely. New King, New King James Version, I am dark but lovely. Revised Standard Version, I am very dark but comely. And New Revised Standard Version, the version we use today, says I am black and beautiful. You know, as you are talking about what is happening in our country, and I know many of you are, I ask you to notice your use of the word but. George Floyd's death is tragic, but. Police brutality is terrible, but. I know there is racism in this country, but. When you use this word, stop and ask yourself two things. When I use this word, what is emphasized when I use it? Where is the emphasis? The second thing is, and maybe even more importantly, is to ask yourself, how will my black friends hear what I just said? This is the power of a tiny word. Last week, I had the talk with my 14-year-old daughter, my beautiful child of color. And by the talk, I do not mean the birds and the bees. Because of the culture that we live in, the talk is a necessary conversation that parents of children of color have to have with their children because it could mean the difference between life and death. Keep your hands visible at all times. Always say what you are doing before you do it. Be in control of your emotions. Be polite and respectful. If you get detained, do not say anything, write anything, or sign anything. Wait for me to come and ask for a lawyer. And never, never run from the police. It was a hard conversation to have, and it provoked in me such grief and sadness. 
And what pained me even more is that in the luxury of my being white, I actually had to come to the realization that I even needed to have the talk. Not one single black parent has ever had that luxury. They have been having the talk for generations. And again, my white privilege is exposed. I was blind and now I see a little bit more clearly. And thank God for that. It has been pointed out to me that there are two pandemics going on right now. The coronavirus is new, but the pandemic of racism is older than our country. Both pandemics call on us to answer for the disparity of our country and the world. Both pandemics ask us to clarify what is church? What does it mean to be the body of Christ? They ask us to ask ourselves, does our current model bear any resemblance to what God, what God is calling us to do? George Floyd's death prompted the writing of this sermon, but it is set in the larger context of racism. We live in a culture where many of us who are white do not want to acknowledge this, only seen but when it comes to people of color, in particular, black people. We participate in systems that do not value black lives in the same way they value white lives. And you know, and I know you know, that it grieves the very heart of God. And it grieves the very heart of Jesus, our darker skinned incarnate God who protested the injustices of the money changers in the temple by overturning their tables and over, overturning the seats that they were sitting in. It grieves the heart of God. Our church has been silent on the issue of racism. Our sessions have been silent on this issue. It's not that there haven't been sermons on the subject, and some of you read Small Great Things with me, which deepened our understanding of what it's like to be black in a white world. But collectively, we have remained silent. silent. Mick and I had a long talk on Monday, and we are ready and committed. We will be talking to the session on Tuesday. So I ask you, are you ready? On the path of life, there are deciding moments. Deciding moments where we can choose to continue to do what we are doing on this issue of racism, or we can dare to take a bolder, more authentic, and trusting way, even if it seems riskier and less safe. In my conversations with you, I know that many of you are grieving over what is happening in our country, and I know that sometimes you don't know what to say and are afraid to say the wrong thing and often you say not, nothing and do nothing. I understand this because I have been there and sometimes I am still there. However, in light of this, we must ask ourselves a question. When God asks us to seek justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly, do you think this silence is what God means? God is asking us to be courageous. Are you ready? Let us know. Text or email me three tiny words, I am ready. 
And for those of you who are, my promise is to you that together we will begin a new and sustained path of listening, understanding, and action. I hope my inbox is overrun. I am ready. The power of three tiny words. We can do this. And now there are four. Well, it's time for me to end this sermon and I will end it with hope and a message from a huge supporter of our church. Today, I wear a red stole, even though Pentecost was last week. Pentecost is not about one Sunday in the liturgical year when we remember God's spirit was unleashed into the world. Pentecost is about God's spirit working in the here and the now. And I have hope because I can see it. Police officers taking a knee with protesters, white people alongside black people demanding justice, black men stepping over the line to shake an officer's hand, protesters around the world wanting something different and better for our country and for the world. There is something different about what is happening now. There is something in the air, which is in the message of John Molina Moore, the executor presbyter of the National Capital Presbyter, Presbytery and a huge supporter of our church. Take a look and a listen to his message and then ask yourself, am I ready? thousand years ago, we celebrated the birthday of the church. We call this day Pentecost, the story of these early disciples when they take their story beyond a collection of tales told around the Galilean countryside and a story now that is spread to the furthest ends of the earth. That was only possible those 2,000 years ago because of something that was in the air. The presence of the Holy Spirit blowing this gust of wind to knock open doors, to push back windows, and to create a path for the church to go next. 2,000 years later, today in 2020, there is also something in the air, something that feels very different. Over these past 10 days, I have seen friends and, and churches and pastors who have typically remained silent in the face of blatant racism and injustice, now saying that they have had enough. What is it that they can do? They are listening as this gust of wind of the presence of the Spirit is getting louder and more deafening in our ears, calling us to move beyond where we are now to what we can be as a church, as a presbytery, as a country, and as a world. Over the next week and a half, our presbytery will be releasing a couple of resources to help our churches. Our presbytery says we are committed to being an anti-racist presbytery, so we will be offering resources for churches who have already begun this work and churches who now just find themselves stepping in to what might be ahead. Friends, my word of encouragement to all of you is like those early disciples that we trust and we listen to what is in the air around us. What is it calling us to be and to do and to grow into? When a violent gush of wind comes in, it changes the landscape. It gives us an opportunity to step into something next. That is happening right now. Let us continue to pray. Let us continue to be in relationship with each other, trusting voices that don't look like us, that don't sound like us, but trusting that we are all woven together by that same spirit who is holding all of us, God's beautiful representation of, of Christ here on earth known as the church. So National Capital Presbytery, continue to do your work, continue to do your ministry, continue to challenge what is happening right now as we step into, start to step into, what we could be.
Friends, many times I have stood at this table and I have reminded you that it is our Lord's table. It does not belong to any one church or one denomination. And I have invited you to bring all that you are to this table, your hopes and your fears, your grief and your joy. I've invited you to bring all that to the table. Today I invite you to bring other things along with those things. I invite you to bring to the table those times, each of us to bring to the table those times when we have been silent and should have spoken. Those times when we have spoken and should have been silent. I invite you, each of us, to bring our prejudices, both known and unknown. And I invite you to know, know that our Lord Jesus is here. Our Lord Jesus, who is full of grace and mercy. So I invite you to come to this table. Please join with me in our great prayer of thanksgiving. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift our hearts to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. In every time and age, O God, it is good and faithful that we give you thanks, for your mercy is sure, and your steadfast love endures forever. In your compassion you gave us Christ Jesus, who sets us free from death and leads us to eternal life. And so with all creation, with all the needy and the hungry ones, with all those who have enough and plenty, with creatures large and small, with sun and moon and stars, and with the saints of every age, we praise your holy name. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all things. By your power and love, you can continue to deliver your people from bondage, thwart the designs of evil, show the way through the wilderness, turn hardship into righteousness, and reveal your hand upholding the just. Blessed are you, O Christ, servant of the universe. You came among us to feed and heal and teach, to confound the haughty and to confuse the deceivers, to challenge the wrong-hearted, and in all these things to give us hope for those who long for peace. Blessed are you, O Spirit, giver of life. You give us the words when we have none. You fill us with vision when we have the most need. You give us voice to proclaim our faith in every hour. Be our guide and teacher today and always. Come now, Prince of Peace, Spirit of love, breath of life. Bring to all who are hurting in this world the joy that you give us in Christ Jesus. And teach us to proclaim that we have seen the Lord. In the unity of the Holy Trinity, we, in gratitude for this great day of resurrection, we praise you, God of all that is, now and forever. Amen. And we join together in the prayer that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread of life. In the same manner after supper was ended, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks to God, he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Take and drink from it, all of you. The apostle Paul reminds us that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we do show forth the Lord's death until he returns. 
Let us partake together. Please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Living Christ, as you open the scriptures to us, you make yourself known in the breaking of the bread. We realize as we break bread together, we are not alone, that we are at this table with people from diverse backgrounds, different denominations, and from different cultural experiences. No matter our skin color, no matter what part of the country we live in or what part of the world we live in, we are at your table together, one in Jesus Christ. Give us strength to move from this table today to be your disciples in our world, to make a difference, to be moved by the plight and anguish of so many, that we may speak out and proclaim your good news of resurrection, that we are all one in Christ Jesus. Help all of us in our own lives to leave this table, putting an end to our own bigotry, making a difference in our world today by confronting racism, and choosing to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Send us out now with your Holy Spirit to change the world and to show your love. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I give you the charge and benediction, we want to thank you for your gracious support of our ministry here at Providence in these difficult and challenging times. And we thank all those that have tuned in from around the country 
I was so excited to see that some of my high school friends tuned in from Minnesota and they actually have given to our ministry here as well. So thank you for your wonderful support. I charge you now to go out into the world in peace, expecting always the unexpected and anticipating miracles, knowing that with God, all things are possible. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. And all God's people say together, Amen.